Thank you. Um, so this is EXP106, detecting infectious diseases with biometrics and bioinformatics. Hopefully you are in the right session. If you are not, you're going to have a great time anyways. My name is Erin Chu. I am the Life Sciences Lead on the AWS Open Data Team, part of the Global Social Impact Organization. Um, and I'm here to introduce our two excellent speakers, Dr. Michael Snyder from Stanford University and Dr. Ali Ranavard from George Washington University. Very brief agenda of what we're going to talk about today. I already did the intro, so we're already ahead of time. <laughs> and we are then going to talk a little bit about this program called the Diagnostic Development Initiative, which both Dr. Snyder and Dr. Ranavard are awardees of. Just a little bit of the history, what it is, and hopefully what we're going to be doing in the future with it. And we'll go into two separate talks by Dr. Michael Snyder and Dr. Ali Ranavard. And then we will have, if we have time, we'll have some room for Q&A from the audience. Um, a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, please raise your hand and the mic runners will bring a mic to you. Um, and we'll also be outside for a little bit after the session. So let's talk a little bit about this program called the Diagnostic Development Initiative, or as we lovingly refer to it, the DDI. Where did this come from? I actually can still remember in about February 2020, it was, it was actually right before we'd really locked down in a meeting with Maggie Carter, who's our social impact lead, global social impact lead. And we said, we've got to do something. There's something happening that none of us have really seen before. How can we mobilize the might and the abilities of AWS to do greater good, to help all of us who are struggling through this? Um, and we kind of narrowed in after a lot of back and forth on the fact that we know that in order to battle a pandemic, you need to be able to diagnose a pandemic. And we also know that historically, the field of diagnostics is underfunded relative to things like therapeutics. So we came up with the Diagnostic Development Initiative. What exactly is this? Well, we know that this is actually a two-year, $20 million commitment from AWS aimed at funding um, diagnostic methodologies, assays, solutions towards specifically the COVID pandemic diagnosing, but also other infectious diseases and pandemics. This is a credits only program. So that means it's not a cash program. It meant that we were dispensing credits in order to enable people's work on AWS. And we also provided technical expertise via AWS Professional Services or ProServe. And when we first started DDI, we'll call it the phase one in 2020, we really had one category and that was diagnosis. Hence, AWS Diagnostic Development Initiative. Um, those were largely restricted to, at the time it was really molecular assays, right? Can we pick up nucleic acid or DNA um, that is a signature of COVID? Can we detect the antibodies that people are generating in response to the infection? Can we detect the antigens or the protein pieces that are again signatures of COVID? Uh, since we've entered phase two, which was earlier this year, we've added three additional categories. One is early disease detection. The fact is some of the first signs of COVID are not really definitive of COVID. They're a high fever, they're a cough, shortness of breath. How can we use that to warn someone, hey, you might be sick, why don't you quarantine, right? Why don't you, why don't you go get a test? Um, the next was prognosis. Again, not quite diagnostic, but highly informative of maybe we should be mobilizing folks to the ICU. Can we predict whether someone is likely to have an excellent outcome with just bed rest and care, or is this someone that we should tag for additional diagnostics, follow-up, and heavy monitoring? And then finally, public health genomics. I've been in the genomics industry for over a decade at this point. This is the first time in my life where I say, yeah, I'm a genomicist, and people say, Oh, so you work with variants, like with COVID. And I'm like, exactly, like with COVID, right? Genetics has become part of the social conversation of COVID, and it has become a tool for us to not only monitor the outbreaks where we can predict in changes in infectiousness, changes in response by the host. Um, it's become a tool for us to really get ahead of this pandemic. So what have we done so far? We have awarded $8 million of those $20 million to, I believe it is, I can't see the screen here, 87 organizations from 17 different countries. And these have really ranged from projects, again, 
aimed at efficient performance detection of the virus, all the way to uh, predicting COVID uh, from medical imaging to detecting symptoms of COVID uh, from wearable devices. You're gonna hear about that in just a few minutes. What do we have in store for us? Well, eight minus, or 20 minus eight is still a positive number. So we have until December 30th of 2021 for you to submit additional applications. Please do go ahead and apply. If you have any questions, uh, head to our website or feel free to contact me uh, by email. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Snyder from Stanford University. He is going to tell you a little bit about his work, and then we'll move on to Dr. Ali. All right, well, great. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, and I will tell you about our work using wearable devices, smartwatches, to actually detect COVID-19. Now this work stems from some work we've been doing to use big data in general to try and actually transform healthcare. So just to remind you, your health is influenced by many things. It's your genome, it's various exposures, including COVID-19, uh, stress, lifestyle changes, food you eat, all impact your health. We're in a world where you can now measure many of these different things, some quite well, some pretty clunky, uh, but more importantly, you can measure the effects of these things on human physiology and biochemistry, and that actually serves as early warnings, if you will, for early diagnostics. And so uh, a number of years ago, we set up what we call um, personal omics profiling, the, the, the ability to be able to, to um, ma make deep data measurements on people. Uh, we sequence their genome, we make as many molecular measurements as possible out of their blood and urine, even their microbiome. Uh, we do wearables as well, and that's what I'll get to in a minute. Uh, and then we also do this longitudinally. We've been following a group of people now for about eight and a half years to be able to figure out uh, what it means to be healthy, how does that change, and actually can these advanced technologies that our lab invents as, as do others to be able to better manage people's health. And the upshot of this is that just from the first three plus years of profiling these 100, 109 people, smallish cohort, we actually found 49 major health discoveries. And some of these are a big deal. For example, uh, if you look in the bottom in the heme oncology area, we discovered, uh, caught some with early lymphoma, uh, several people with precancers, that MGUS, smoldering myeloma, those are precancers. And then uh, we also caught people with serious heart issues, uh, metabolic uh, situations, and so on. So these advanced technologies we've been using for profiling people have turned out to be quite powerful, and we've actually spun off companies for this. Now, for the subject of today's talk, we actually found wearables were one important component. So no one technology actually uncovered all these things. This is a combination of things, genome sequencing, deep molecular profiling, but wearables turned out to be quite powerful. So we, for example, caught someone with AFib, from uh, wearable devices, sleep apnea. And what spurred the, the work I'm gonna tell you about today is we actually detected my Lyme disease of all things using a smartwatch and a pulse ox. So um, I'll show you that in a minute. So what about wearables? Why are they so powerful? Well, they actually make hundreds of thousands of measurements. Even the cheapest devices will make hundreds of thousands of measurements on you every day, and they'll measure you 24-7, 365 days a year if you keep your batteries charged. Uh, they're worn by millions of people. In fact, 20% of the US is actively wearing a smartwatch these days, 50 million people. And what's powerful about them is they measure many, many different physiological parameters. So for example, they'll measure heart rate, heart rate variability, uh, sleep, um, even blood oxygen, which is not always so accurate, but the delta in blood oxygen, changes in blood oxygen are pretty easy to pick up and so on. So you can measure a lot of different things. And I'm a big believer in this. In fact, I'm wearing four smartwatches right now. I use eight of these devices every day. Uh, so I collect a lot of data on myself, uh, but actually, as, as I point out, many others do as well. And I forgot to say, some smartwatches will even make 2.5 million measurements per day on people. So they're really deep great at deep profiling all the time. And so, as I say, the way we got into this was actually was using these, and I detected my Lyme disease. I won't spend much time on this, uh, but basically it turns out that uh, my, uh, from a smartwatch, I saw my heart rate went up. I also saw from a pulse ox, my blood oxygen dropped. Okay, I first picked it up on an airline, but it didn't come back to normal when we landed. 
Uh, and it turns out, um, went on to show it was in fact Lyme disease. Again, that was before symptoms. And uh, we wrote algorithms. It turns out, I later learned, I should point out, my skin temperature elevated as well. So all this was done prior to symptoms. I later got symptoms. I went to a doctor. I was actually in Norway at the time, and it was diagnosed as a bacterial infection. Um, and um, he wanted to give me penicillin. I said, no, I should take doxycycline, which is what you do for Lyme, little standoff there for a few moments. But he did give in, gave me doxycycline, and it cleared it up. Uh, Anyway, the point out of all this is then we went back and looked. I had two years of data at the time and looked at uh, all the data. And it turns out there were four times when I was ill during that period. One was a Lyme, two times with viral infections. The top one up here, I guess I do have a pointer. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, viral infection there, viral infection there. And I had a fourth time where I was asymptomatic, but I was ill because I had high what's called C-reactive protein. And every single time, when we, retrospectively, we could see I had high resting heart rate and high elevated skin temperature in hindsight. Okay? So we wrote some algorithms, actually, to be able to detect, uh, retrospectively at the time, that you could see this jump up in heart rate when you got ill from every one of those four situations, including the asymptomatic case. We called the algorithm change of heart. So we actually published this now almost five years ago. And then, obviously, uh, March 2020, is when the pandemic hit the US, certainly probably came before that, but certainly that's when it became acutely aware. Uh, and basically, this is where we are today. There's still around 150,000 new cases diagnosed every day. So as you might imagine, uh, uh, the way, what are we doing now for the pandemic? Well, we use a uh, temperature, which if you think about it, it's a 300-year-old technology to try and tell whether somebody's getting ill. We do use new devices that don't even work very well in winter, right? If somebody shines an IR light on you, uh, as you walk in from the outside, I measure 33 degrees centigrade. If I was 33 degrees centigrade, I'd probably be dead. So the point is they don't work that well. The gold standard is PCR, and when there's a crunch like right now, uh, you can wait three days to get your test result back, and you don't do it every day because it's expensive and it's inconvenient. So if you think about it, wearable devices are actually pretty powerful for telling you whether you're getting ill because they're measuring you all the time. So we tested this idea about whether we could detect COVID using a smartwatch, consumer-grade smartwatch, and the answer is we can. So when the pandemic hit, we scaled up the study pretty quickly. We partnered with some of the leading fit, uh, companies, Fitbit, Garmin, et cetera, and we very quickly enrolled 5,300 people. The first step is to see, can we detect COVID with a smartwatch? And so we had 32 people wearing a Fitbit at the time they were ill with COVID, and they had a diagnosis date and a symptom date. So the, they were what we call gold standard data sets. And it turns out, uh, this is our very first case. If you look over here, this is just resting heart rate. Uh, the purple is when they're diagnosed with COVID. The red is when their symptoms first appeared, but their heart rate jumped up nine and a half days prior to symptom onset. You can't miss that signal, it's very obvious. And I'll show you our online detection system in a minute. You can pick that up in a real time detection system. So basically this person's probably been running around spreading it for nine and a half days without even knowing it because he was asymptomatic. So it turns out it worked in 26 of 32 cases. So 80% of the time, we could pick this jump up and resting heart rate just from a smartwatch. And uh, it turns out it's a median of four days prior to symptom onset, uh, seven days prior to diagnosis state. And it's not specific for COVID, as you might imagine. If you're ill with other things, it picks it up as well. Although there, the median is two days. Now, we do miss it in some cases. I think we have a hard time getting stable backgrounds on certain people, so it's hard to pick up that jump up in heart rate. So we've gone on and made a real-time detection system. This is actually um, uh, retrospective data once again, uh, and it works pretty well. We take uh, um, people's resting heart rate for 28 days and on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, and we look for a jump up that's statistically significant, we set it to a sensitivity so alarms go off every six weeks. And so the reality is it works pretty well. Um, it, uh, basically, here's one case where, same thing, this person I can't see very well, I think they jump, the alarm goes off about seven days prior to um, symptoms. There's another case um, over here on this side where it goes up, I think, nine days. Uh, there are other bumps. These are real signals. In this case, a lot of people get bumps over the holidays. We think that could either be due to stress, alcohol. All these things will trigger these alarms. I'll talk about that more in a minute. 
Other infections will trigger it as well. It's not COVID specific. And even healthy people will get these bumps. These are real signals. They're, they're due to elevated heart rates for prolonged periods. Okay. So as I say, we've gone on now actually through a cloud-based system, which is the purpose of the session, to be able to do real-time detection with a smartwatch. Okay. It's a research study, but we've written new algorithms to actually do this lightweight because we want to do this for millions of people. And so we want all of you to sign up. So you'll see, see down here, please sign up if you have a smartwatch. So the goal is really to do this for the entire planet. 60% of the planet has a smartphone. And so basically what we're doing is we're detecting uh, when you see a jump up, a statistically significant jump up in heart rate over your background. Uh, this is a lighter weight algorithm we're using, but it lets us do it at scale, as I say, for millions of people. And so it does work. Uh, so um, basically here's one example. The dates are shifted. Uh, we'll set off a daily alarm. You, you just click uh, on the app, and basically if, if you're getting a jump up in heart rate, you'll get a red signal over uh, what would normally be a green time. This is a symptom date, and they were diagnosed the next day. And once again, it works 80% of the time. It's not perfect. I think, again, because we're not pulling in all the data we'd like to, and in part because some people it's hard to get stable backgrounds. But it works quite well overall. And it doesn't just work on pre-symptomatic cases. I should say 80% at or before the time of symptom onset. In this case, it's a median of three days prior to symptom onset. Uh, it does pick up asymptomatic cases. I forgot to say, we've got it set up so it'll work for both Fitbit, Apple Watch, I'm pretty sure it'll work for others as well. We just don't have as much data. Here's an asymptomatic case where someone had jump up in signal. There's a diagnosis date there. Uh, this is an Apple Watch example, diagnosis date, jump up in signal there. So we can, again, pick up even the asymptomatic cases in 14 of 18 situations. Okay, it also will jump up if you get vaccinated, typically. So here's two examples. I, uh, I think this one's Pfizer, I can't quite read it. One's Pfizer, one's Moderna. Anyway, this person actually got a signal from both the first dose and second dose. This person only from the second dose and so on and so forth. So, uh, and those are fever times. Once again, it's not specific for COVID. Other uh, things will trigger these alarms. Uh, if you just focus on the green, stress is the number one trigger. But intense exercise, alcohol, not just two drinks for dinner, but if you really tie one over, you're hung over the next day, you will set off alarms. So, so most of this you can contextualize. If these alarms are going off, you've been drinking too much, it doesn't mean it's COVID uh, or some other illness. So the point is, uh, in some cases, though, we do see stress and other things trigger it. You're going to have to do follow-up tests uh, in the long run. Right now, this is just a, a detection system. We haven't set, uh, we, don't, we don't give medical um, recommendations back to people. Uh, we built a, an infrastructure. Here's where we're using the Amazon diagnosis, uh, Diagnostic Initiative uh, help. We're basically building a data ocean to be able to pull in all wearable data, do this real-time detection in the cloud on time. We've set it up so it can actually do this all around the globe. Uh, and basically, it's scalable to millions of people. So that's why we want you all to sign up. We want to get better at this, and that's our ultimate goal. Uh, this is our COVID detection team. We've assembled, we started with a team, very small team of people, but obviously when COVID hit, we wanna actually make an impact on this pandemic now, not 10 years from now. And so this is what we've been up to. So with that in mind, I should have saved time for questions. So if you have any, I'm happy to take them. Quiet. <laughs> Uh, Aaron's going to ask one, but I think someone in the back is going to ask one, too. Hey, um, thank you. Uh, I have an interesting question. Have you heard of the biometric kind of testing of stool in, like, toilets? Because uh -oh. I know it's, like, not it's the most It's hard to glamorous. hear up here. Can oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? Better. Sorry. Okay. Well, the study of, like, or the testing of stool in, like, toilets... I know it's like not the most glamorous of fields, but it's, I feel like it has a, a really big possibility because it's um, not something that you have to wear and there's, there might be a lot of biometric things that you could look into. I'm curious on your thoughts of that or if that's even anywhere that you've been thinking about anything. Um, yeah, I couldn't quite hear it because it kind of echoes up here. Did you, were you able to catch that? Shoot.
Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Now, that's another detection system. Uh, it's probably not something you're going to do every day, sample your stool, but it's a great way of looking at probably population scale. So as you might imagine, there's people now in, in cities looking at sewage plants for just that reason. So I think that's a fine detection system, too. Oh. I mean, like, through the toilet, like oh, a putting toilet devices system. on toilets for the mass is to kind of mass and use the cloud to kind of con con grab all that data and make sure. sense of it. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I think these toilet sensors are very interesting, too. I think they're probably better. They're obviously biochemical sensors for the most part. I think that unless you're doing for blood detection in the stool, then people can do that spectroscopically. Uh, so I think stool detection is an interesting system. I would argue we, th we think this has greater potential because it's measuring all the time in real time, not just once a day. But, um, you know, in, in this environment, you probably want as many detection systems as possible. So, yeah, certainly all these are, are very interesting to pursue. There's a question over here. Ah, that works. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, fascinating. I always like to see scientists experimenting on themselves. Um, if you had a, you're doing real time um, pulse measurement now, uh, which is fantastic. If you if you could choose one other metric to do real time analysis of, if you're going to tell the smartwatch manufacturers, if you're going to build one extra metric into to give you greater accuracy at whatever you want to do, is it, what would it be? Yeah, you mean one that we don't have already? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe I should... a whole bunch of other things you can choose from. Yeah, let me tell you the ones that we're pretty confident of. Heart rate is really good, resting yeah. heart rate. But I actually think uh, walking heart rate will probably even be better, which we don't do. <laughs> and that's because we haven't quite set up the right corrections yet and done all our proper deep learning and such. Uh, but heart rate variability gives a signal. Other groups have shown that. We're picking that up as well. Um, changes in blood oxygen I mentioned before is useful. The absolute measurements from a smartwatch are not very good, but as I said before, the changes are quite good. What we haven't incorporated yet are things like galvanic stress response, which is conductance on the skin, which some watches do measure. And I think they'll be powerful too because your, your skin conductance does change with virtually all health states, diabetes, get, diabetics get dry skin and so on and so forth. So I think that's a good measurement. So what are we missing? Well, I'd like to see real -time, more real-time biochemical measurements, and I'd love to see more spectroscopic measurements. And I don't know enough about the physics to know which ones we can pick up through the skin. But we have another paper where we can show a lot of clinical measurements you can pick up from a smartwatch, like hemocrit, hemoglobin, things like that, because the PPG signals on your smartwatch actually do give some they're not clinical diagnostic grade value, but they're good enough to say something's up. You might be getting anemia uh, because your hemoglobin levels are dropping. So I think what these things can do is give you, even if they're not perfect clues that something's up, and the fact that they're measuring you again 24-7 lets you find that this is a consistent signal. This isn't just a one-off thing. So you might want to go get a follow-up test. It's a great question, though. And I'm always trying to think of new ideas we can should be putting on smartwatches. One last que question, apparently. Actually, I have two questions. <laughs> One first question is, would you pre uh, go back to how to enroll uh, those programs? I have a Fitbit, so I just want to know how to enroll. Uh, you said that I can actually, the people can enroll the, that uh, data collection, right? Yeah. That actually data goes to Stanford or it goes to the uh, Fitbit or different? The yeah, the data will go usually to the company and then we have to retrieve it to the company. Although you can upload certain data like Garmin and Apple right into HealthKit. It's still, the company will have access to it, but it can come directly to us. So there are ways to come here, uh, to come right to the study participants so, or to the uh, groups like us who are measuring this. Uh, I'm 100% conflicted, but we formed a company called Sensomics where the data actually goes right to us and doesn't go to the company. Because some people, as you might imagine, don't want their data going to anybody 
but for some reason they trust Stanford and so us. So is, is there any site that I, I can enroll that the program? Yeah, you can enroll right now. Okay. So download the app and off you go. Okay, second question is how, do, how about the data uh, privacy? So those the data- Data privacy? Put, yes. Yeah, uh, you know, we have tried to be as secure as possible. Everything we do is encrypted. Uh, I would say nothing is unhackable. Um, so that, I suppose, could be a concern. I myself am not as worried about these kinds of data. I don't think they're nearly as sensitive as, say, your credit card data, which you're sharing all the time. So um, I guess I'll, I'll say that, you know, having a health monitor is more important than probably giving up your heart rate information that's potentially hackable. So I would argue that I think this, this could become you know, standard practice, and if somebody starts abusing it, well, then we need laws to protect people so that doesn't, they don't get abused. That's how I see it. So, but as I say, privacy, people worry a lot about privacy on health data, but they share their credit card data just fine, which I find a little um, strange because, as I say, there's a lot of sensitive data uh, on your credit card. Anyway, thanks again for having me. Good morning, everyone. So thank you all for being here. And thanks, Michael and Erin, for the great introduction and uh, all this cool you know, research that's happening in COVID-19. So I'm going to continue with the decoding of omics data in uh, uh, COVID-19. And uh, so if I discuss the differences uh, in terms of the type of uh, projects that we lead here in terms of COVID-19. We look at uh, molecular level of COVID-19. I thought, you know, they're gonna go to the next slide. So let me just start with how we investigate the human health in general with new technologies. Let's call them omics data. So as you can see, we can measure many, many uh, omics data. And this omics data includes microbial species, includes the gene expression from human, includes small molecules, we call them metabolites, or large molecules, proteins. All these different measurements can be collected now easily in many large scale you know, studies. So here, if we collect all these measurements, each give us a bit of information about our health. How we can put all this to draw a picture of health conditions and that's what we do here. We use omics data that, or omics technologies that measure many features for us that can tell us about our, about our health. And our main goal here is to see how all this together uh, can describe our health conditions. If we look at the COVID-19 here, all we might hear about the spike protein. The spike protein is part of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that binds to a human protein, ACE2, and enters to the human cell, and that's how the infection starts. And that mechanism that we see here uh, is well known now. So if we look at the SARS-CoV-2 as a whole here, there is a specific mechanism that most of uh, vaccines they target to, to stop, and that is to stop the binding between the spike protein to the human protein here, that, that's a pathway that, you know, facilitates the, uh, the virus entrance to the human cells. So there are two major questions we here we want to ask using these omics technologies that allow us to measure many features and look at those features and say what's going on during the COVID infection. Number one is how the viral genome uh, as a one omic evolves and how that is related to the, the outcome of the uh, COVID-19. Uh, the second big question here we want to ask is how the human body responds to those infections. So these are the two general questions here we want to ask using these omic technologies that they measure many uh, features. We call them biomarkers that they can help us to understand the biology of this infection. So if we look at the virus genome, that's a big picture of that. Each 
uh, color shows a different region of the genome, the viral genome. And you see here the spike protein has a region as well, or a coding area. And we can look at many samples, many in the in infected individuals uh, samples. So if we measure and sequence the virus from infected individuals, then we can look at those genomes of the viruses and see how those are related to, to the information we get from the infected individuals. Here, for example, what we have shown, a very basic question, how the SARS-CoV-2, which is one type of coronavirus family, are related to each other. And here we show each point is a different, oh, sorry, different uh, virus genome, and we see the SARS-CoV-2 family all, all close to each other compared to the other SARS uh, co uh, coronavirus uh, viruses. So basically by looking at the viral genome, we can understand how those change and what they are related to. One question in this area was to see if we look at the known regions in the SARS-CoV-2 genome, which one of them is a spike protein, is a target for uh, uh, vaccine, how that is related to the other regions to look and characterize those changes in SARS-CoV-2 to the other regions, maybe we can find a new targets for vaccine or treatment in general. So if you look at the first row here, this is um, the variation of the whole genome in relation to all the regions. If you look at the variation in the virus genome that infects the individuals, and look how that is related to the other specific region of the virus, that helps us to understand and characterize the evolving uh, path of this virus. So here I'm highlighting few regions that shows they have a highest variation in correlation to the whole genome. For example, if you look at here, those regions, uh, ORF1A and ORF1B, so those ha are big regions in the virus genome, and they are very highly correlated to, to the whole genome. But there are few places like NSP3 and uh, uh, a spike protein that they have a high correlation to the viral genome. That means we find two specific regions in the viral genome that they carry most of the variation in the virus genome. One is a spike protein, which we already know is a target for vaccine, and there is another region, NSP3, which is the non-structural protein 3, which has the similar behavior as a spike protein does, right? And that leads us to go deeper and see what that protein do, does, and then how we, can, how we can investigate it further for maybe vaccine development. So you see here NSP3, which is another region in the virus and not being investigated as a target for, for vaccine, is highly correlated to the spike protein, which is a known region for vaccine, vaccine target. So this uh, leads us to a specific region in the viral genome and see what are the function of those regions and try to maybe target them for future vaccine development. So when we look at these two, if we look at the number of mutation happens in the viral genome across the world, so we see these two regions that I highlight here, they correlate to each other, NSP3, and a spike protein. So those are two specific regions in the viral genome that we can look at them closely and might they have some function related to each other. Some of the, uh, some of the regions are very big, some regions are very small, and that's the spike protein that I'm showing here, and that's the NSP3 that we see this variation, they co-occur as we see in this figure. So, so far what we found using the viral genome as a one omic, uh, to find a specific region in the virus genome that they can be targeted for vaccine development. So you see this is a very deep uh, uh, understanding of the viral genome and see how we can target those specific regions. So one thing, this is from like about 150,000 samples across the world and we try to see and show a very simple but important concept that the virus genome is independent of the host. 
the individual that get infected. And here, what we are showing, if you see a dark blue means there is a correlation between uh, different region of the virus and the information that time we had about the individuals. For example, two things that I highlight here is one is sex and age of the infected individuals. And there is a less relationship between those information we have about the infected individual versus the variation we see in different region in the virus. So that was an early uh, um, finding, but later we found also the day, the time from the beginning of uh, pandemic has a relation to the variation we see in the virus. That, that tells us that the virus is evolving, and it is all, all known information. But help us to show the approach we took is really um, working in terms of looking at the specific regions of the virus. Also, we keep the whole genome uh, as a one resource here. And that leads us again to, to some you know, correlation among these variations in relation to the information we have about infected individuals. So that part of the, that was the first question that we want to look at the viral genome variation and see how that is related to the information we have about the infected individuals. But one bigger question here is how our body responds to the infection. And here what we are, I'm showing, this is from a published study we, where they collected small molecules from blood samples, uh, metabolites, and large molecules, proteins, from the same uh, individuals. And they had a very nice four groups that we investigated later. They had uh, individuals that they were infected by SARS-CoV-2 with the severe outcome, uh, individuals uh, positive COVID-19 but no symptom, and people who had a similar symptom as a COVID-19, but they were COVID-19 negative. And healthy people, individuals in the study. So if here we look at uh, age as a one of the information, we see among the people who were infected, uh, people that in the higher uh, range of age range, they, were, they had a more severe outcome. That tells us that the body response to the the infection is different, and that's one of the reasons is the patient's characteristics, such as age. So, and we see that that is really important. So then the next question was, can we look at this, the body response to the infection and relate them to the severity and other symptoms within the body, including like inflammation in in lung or kidney and other organs. So we try to use the molecule shifts or dynamics in the body after infections compared to the individual that they were not infected or they were infected, but they had the symptoms like COVID-19 symptoms, but they were not COVID-19 positive. And we want to see what are those changes that we can detect them as a biomarkers for diagnostics COVID-19. So we have these different groups, and one, we want to see how those are related to the symptoms we see, and also can we use them to detect the COVID-19 and diagnose it. So here what I'm showing is a investigation on small molecules, metabolites, you see them in the left, and I'm showing 20 first molecules that they were significantly changed when we compared the severe group versus healthy group. Green means that they were increased this, the level of these metabolites, and red means decreased. And asterisk next to them means those changes, they were significant based on our statistical test. And we keep those order based on the, uh, the effect uh, or the effect size here. More means more change, and uh, again, the red means the reduce and the green means uh, increase in the level of those metabolites in the group, uh, the severe group. Then what we were doing, what we looked also uh, was the non-COVID-19 group against the healthy group, and non-COVID-19, the people who had the symptoms, but they were COVID-19 negative. And what the key here for us was to find biomarkers, sp specific molecules that they significantly significantly change in the COVID uh, positive group, which are the severe and non-severe, 
versus the non-COVID-19. Basically, we want to diagnose people based on their metabolites. And here, that's one example. If you, if you look at the cytosine, uh, you see that it's increased in both COVID-19 groups, the severe and non-severe group. But it has a, a small amount compared to those groups in non-COVID-19 and the healthy groups. So that leads us to a specific biomarkers here, like cytosine, that increases during the infection, and it can be used as a biomarker to diagnose COVID-19. There are other molecules not listed here that they have a decrease in terms of level of metabolites in blood, and those also they can be used as a biomarker to diagnose COVID-19. And here we show the citrulline as a one example. Here, by the way, in the bottom, you see the number of sample has been used in a study uh, for each group. So we learn the dynamics of small molecules in our body when we get infected as individuals with the COVID-19. We learn how we can use those changes as a biomarkers for diagnosing COVID-19. One question that we are investigating is what those changes mean in terms of pathway and the functions that they do in our body. And also, we can use all these changes that we see in the biomarkers or COVID omics data. Here, we use proteomics and metabolomics data to predict the, the groups. And here, even we had a very small uh, sample size, less than 100 samples, we were able to accurately, about 80%, detect the groups. Here, remember, we have four groups, healthy, non-COVID, the individuals who had the symptoms similar to uh, severe COVID, and people who had COVID positive but no symptoms, all those with 800 samples, they were giving us a great you know, accuracy in terms of predicting the, the, the health outcome. And, and here we have about 80% accuracy, and here what we... Uh, we are showing in colors are different, you know, traditional machine learning techniques that we use for prediction. And all they work well here. Um, deep uh, neural network, you know, work the best in our case, but we can uh, uh, combine these methods and, you know, have a even higher prediction using this omics data. So, before I go to the last, so we see omics data that can be measured in many studies, give us a big, deep resolution of uh, understanding the human health. And we can combine them, which I didn't show that part here. We can combine these findings from different omics, from the viral genome, from the metabolomics, from the proteins, from the microbial species as well that uh, someone asked about the stool samples. So all those, they can be measured in, la in large studies, and we can measure them all together. And that's going to give us a deep understanding of, uh, of uh, the biological activities that happens in our body in response to infection. And that's what is the next you know, big you know, step that we take in this uh, project. So this work was done in Computational Biology Institute at uh, George Washington. University, so here are my colleagues and students that they contributed in this work. So this project was uh, supported by an, uh, NSF, uh, Gates Foundation, and uh, of, of course the AWS credit for, for, the, for the computational part of the, the activities. All right, with that I want to thank you and I'll take if there is any question. Uh, good morning. Thank you for your uh, uh, seminar. Um, so, did you collect data also from uh, you know second and third you know world countries, or is this just the data from here in the U.S.? And uh, have you applied you know machine language learning to some of your models? Great question. So, this data that I showed actually was 
from another research institute in Wuhan, China, that we, the early stage of the pandemic, they collected the data and they published it. We reused them for our purpose. And I put a reference in the slide when I showed the data. But we are doing what you said, and NSF has supported us to, to actually use the more data that becomes available. In our research, act, we don't really, our focus is not generating the data, because there are many research laboratories and hospitals that they generate the data. We are part of groups that they collect this data and we use them for our questions. And those data become available now more and more. We have our questions to use them, and we are doing that. Thank you. Well, why is cytosine up? and citrulline down in COVID versus others, other infections? So to answer that question, what we are doing is looking at the pathway enrichment analysis. So we know these biomarkers, especially with the co when we talk about the metabolites, we measure about 20,000 small molecules from blood that we have information for. And sometimes it's hard to look at them individually and say why what that means for that specific uh, metabolism. What we are doing actually in that line is to look at these changes and see what is common in terms of structure of those molecules. Do they have a similar structure? But to see why, in terms of biology, we are doing the pathway enrichment analysis to see if there are group of metabolites that they do a function in our body and they upregulate or downregulate. So which is part of our work, but I didn't show it. Awesome talk, Ali. Lots of questions from speakers for speakers, right? Um, one question I had, so I mean, even without knowing the functionality, like the functional relationship between knowing why cytosine's up, citrulline's down, I mean, what is the availability of like bedside tests to um, assess quantity of these biomarkers in real-time COVID cases, right? Can, some, can, a, can a clinician just order a test for citrulline or cytosine? So, so uh, one challenge with the, maybe, it's not going to be a challenge maybe in a year or two, with the omics data is some of them, they require some technologies that, the technology, by the way, is advancing rapidly. For example, for metabol metabolomics profiling, we use liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And that is really, is, you cannot do it on fly. So usually we collect the sample for a big study, then we run and process them you know, all the samples together because the technology, you know, limits has that already. What is evolving? So we are hoping that, you know, these biomarkers, they can be used um, for the detection, you know, you know, early detection of the virus, you know, the infection in the, you know, any disease. And, and the great news here is that the omics data are, you know, omics profiling is moving to big studies. Before, when I say before, maybe a couple years ago, that was, you know, not feasible to collect omics because they're very expensive, technology was not there. But now we see them in the, you know, trials. You know, you see many big cohorts, they are measuring these metabolites, and we can look at their change over the time. So that's actually one of our projects that we look at the dynamic of changes of these small molecules and see if there is a, uh, there is a relationship to the, health status, so it could be the severity status too. 